Hi, everyone. Uh, we will uh, now get started. Uh, so first, just uh, welcome. Um, uh, you know, four wants to express four wants to express uh, uh, their gratitude to uh, a tremendous response to uh, this webinar uh, on only two days notice. Uh, we have nearly 700 participants uh, for this uh, webinar, and uh, we recognize that this is a time of, uh, of great uncertainty uh, and a fast evolving situation uh, on the on the regulatory front, and and really understanding how. Uh, the environment is changing uh, to care for our patients. Um, so we thought that this would be a, a really nice opportunity to, to hold a webinar to, to speak about, um, you know, the changes that are occurring um, really in real time right now. And uh, hopefully we can answer some of your questions uh, regarding these changes during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, we'll, we'll jump right in. So just a quick outline of the webinar. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel and our website, uh, www.4fdn.org. Um, we are we, at the bottom of the, of the Zoom, you'll see that there's a Q&A uh, box down there. And uh, we do plan to have a, a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so please, uh, you know, please submit your questions. Um, you know, if there's a question that you see that is, is, is the same as your question, you can upvote that question. Uh, and that allows us to really get to the, the most pressing questions first. Um, at the end of this, we will be putting together an FAQ with those questions uh, that we'll be posting on our website. So um, if we can't get to everybody today, which is expected with this number, number of participants, um, you know, we will definitely try to get to your question in an FAQ on our website. Um, and of course, you could always submit questions to us directly. Um, so we'll start with a, a quick, we'll start with a quick uh, introduction to four as uh, I think that this may be the first time that some of you um, have, have heard of us, uh, um, as well as going over, you know, what Forbes plans are for the, uh, the COVID-19 national emergency response. Uh, we then will have a presentation by uh, Dr. Hannah Snyder um, uh, going over COVID-19 national emergency guidance around caring for uh, OUD patients in our population. Uh, and we'll finish this off with a, a question and answer session um, with Dr. Snyder, as well as uh, Jody Manns and um, Daniel McLugan, uh, who are experts in uh, policy and uh, legal matters around these issues. So. So the Foundation for Opioid Response was uh, founded in 2018, uh, focused on, on really, at the time, one urgent public health emergency, which was the opioid crisis. Obviously, uh, there's another uh, public health emergency going on, and um, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, right? One emergency does affect um, you know, our patients in, in, in the opioid crisis and then public health emergency as well. Uh, so really trying to figure out you know, how we can care for our patients during this time. Um, our leadership and staff have uh, significant uh, expertise uh, in public health challenges. Our board chair is uh, Dr. Barthwell, who is a uh, past president of ASAM, uh, a past president of ASAM, and our president is uh, Dr. Karen Scott, who has held leadership positions at a, a variety of places such as uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, as well as uh, she served as Chief Medical Officer in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS uh, during the uh, Obama administration. Um, uh, the rest of our board and staff have significant expertise in a variety of areas, such as biomedical research, public policy, healthcare delivery, uh, and health philanthropy. And health philanthropy, um, but. As part of our mission, you know, now more than ever, we, you know, we focus on the opioid crisis and it's critically to think creatively, test new approaches, uh, enhance and expand activities proven to prevent and treat opioid use disorder. Uh, and we're, we're very much committed to, uh, as, as a grant making foundation, funding a diversity of different types of projects uh, that contribute a variety of solutions uh, at the state, national and community levels. Uh, and with that being said, 
I'm sorry, I'm seeing that people are saying that my microphone, it, it, I'm trying to move it as close as possible. Um, the, so with patients at the center, we really focus on uh, four focus areas. This being uh, provider education, payer strategies, policy initiatives, as well as public awareness. Uh, and we're, we're proud that last week we were actually able to announce our first uh, 19 uh, grantees uh, that responded to an RFP that was released last year around access to treatment for vulnerable populations. Uh, we encourage you to go to our website, again, at www.4fdn.org uh, to uh, check out our grantees uh, and learn a little bit more about what the work that they're doing. Um, we do plan to, uh, we do plan to uh, have more opportunities in the future, so we encourage you, again, to go to our website and, and keep an eye out for more uh, opportunities to get involved. So with, uh, obviously, you know, we are in very, very um, uncertain times right now, and extraordinary times with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the national emergency. And here at FOUR, we're really looking for ways to be able to provide broad assistance uh, to not only our grantees, but the community at large uh, during this time. Um, and we're thinking of a couple, we're thinking of a couple different ways uh, that we can uh, contribute to some of these solutions. One is, one of these is, one of this is, I'm sorry, I'm just looking. Uh, so one of these is, uh, you know, we'll be posting on our website uh, and our LinkedIn as well, resources uh, and uh, as well as updated guidance in a, in a, a one uh, stop shop on our website uh, that's gonna have federal guidance of uh, resources uh, regarding all the, the fast evolving regulatory changes that are occurring uh, right now and one of those things uh one of those resources that we actually put up today was uh, is an opinion letter is a, a opinion letter from four uh that goes or analyzes uh it's a legal analysis of four hypothetical situations um involving prescribing buprenorphine uh during this time uh, considering the the changes that have been made in regulations as of right now Again, we understand that this is a fast moving and evolving uh, environment right now. So everything that is presented today um, is uh, obviously with the caveat that things may change in the future. Um, we do are also plan to, uh, you know, because of the response to this webinar, um, you know, we're thinking about having this as a weekly webinar situation, uh, you know, on, on a variety of topics and concerns that, are, that will come out as the situation evolves. Um, so what we would like you to do is um, after this presentation, after over, you'll be directed to a survey and to a poll. And, uh, you know, please fill out that poll. Please submit your concerns, your ideas of how FOR can be helpful, what topics you would want us to cover uh, and such. Um, and also, please just reach out to us in general. You know, we, we, we would be happy to facilitate connections with experts to help and um, with some technical assistance to be able to help you with some of the issues that you're feel, uh, dealing with and just stay close, uh, you know, closely updated to our website at 4fdn.org for the latest updates on the, the situation. With that, we know we have, we are, you know, really grateful to have a, an amazing uh, panel today of experts that are going to be able to uh, not only educate you about what, uh, you know, what the current uh, regulatory environment is right now and how to care for patients in the COVID-19 pandemic environment. Uh, but we also have, uh, again, health policy experts and legal experts. So um, we'll start with a presentation from uh, Dr. Hannah Snyder, who is the uh, co-principal investigator and director of the California Bridge to Treatment Program, uh, who, are, is a part, who is one of our inaugural grantees. So we uh, definitely encourage you to check them out. Uh, she's a family medicine and addiction medicine specialist uh, at uh, the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Um, for the Q&A session, we will also have uh, Jody Manns, uh, from the, who's the project director for chronic and vulnerable populations at the National Academy for State Health Policy to answer any health policy, uh, any policy questions. Uh, and we also have Daniel McClugan, who is an associate at DCBA Law and Policy, who can answer your legal questions uh, regarding the regulatory changes. Uh, Daniel was uh, one of the authors on the, the opinion letter that we have up there. So 
uh, if you've read through that and have any questions, uh, definitely you can direct, direct it to them. Hopefully that sound fixed it up. I'm trying to figure it out. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to, to Hannah Snyder and uh, let her Thanks so much for being here. Um, we are so grateful to have all 490 of you so far. Um, this is really an incredible time. It's a difficult time. It's a time in which the regulations are quickly changing. Um, and we just feel really lucky to have this community of folks who are coming together to work on these important issues. Um, as that introduction showed, I am a physician. I am not a lawyer, I'm not a legal scholar, and therefore the information I'm going to give you today should not be taken as uh, formal, or formal legal advice. Rather, this is my best medical opinion based on what I've been um, given by legal scholars. Um, also, I'm practicing in California. Um, I'm practicing in San Francisco, and this is an issue that is playing out very differently in different communities. So if anything that I'm saying here today doesn't make sense or doesn't fit with your community's needs, um, check in with your local health system and check in with your local public health department. Um, also note that this information is all really rapidly changing um, and that what we say on this webinar today could be out of date as soon as this afternoon. Um, so keep checking back in on the website for more information. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just very briefly introduce the California Bridge Program, who I'm here today representing. We are a program in the state of California that works with acute care hospitals. And our goal is to ensure that people with substance use disorder receive 24-7 high quality care in every California health system. What that means is that patients across the state of California are able to walk into any emergency department, walk into any acute care hospital and say, I want help getting off of pills or heroin. They're then connected with a substance use navigator who um, is able to connect with them, have a, build a relationship with them, talk with them, and determine if they might be right for buprenorphine. In most cases, buprenorphine can be started for those patients that same day during that emergency department visit. Um, and then the substance use navigator helps the patient to navigate to ongoing outpatient care. Um, right now, we have over 50 hospitals across the state of California uh, participating in this program, and over 3,500 patients have been started on buprenorphine in less than a year. Um, our program is really about low barriers, so making it as easy as possible for people to access care, but high support. So we're there for patients no matter when they need us. And I think low barrier, high support should be kind of the theme of our response to uh, people who use drugs in the setting of this COVID pandemic. Um, it's easy to think about the COVID pandemic and think we should be focusing on this and we should shift our focus away from people who use drugs and people with opioid use disorder. And I'm here today to hopefully convince you that that is absolutely not the case, that these two epidemics, the opioid epidemic and the COVID pandemic are quite intertwined. Um, so people who use drugs um, are vulnerable to COVID-19 and are vulnerable to having a more severe outcome. And they're also vulnerable to, to worsening um, outcomes around their drug use in the setting of this pandemic. Um, we have high rates of uh, people experiencing homelessness who use drugs, right? And people who experience homelessness are often living in more congregate living situations. So we have, I know I have a lot of patients in my population who say live in encampments or live in homeless shelters or live in residential treatment programs. In all of those settings, people are at increased risk of contracting COVID-19. We also know that a lot of people who use drugs have other comorbidities. So many of my patients have COPD, have cirrhosis, have HIV, other things that put them at increased risk of a much more severe disease if they do contract COVID-19. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that stigma has always been an issue around people who use drugs, and racism has always been an issue here. And our patients who use drugs often have a lot of fears and distrust of the medical system because of their past experiences. None of that is changing, and all of that is really being amplified in the setting of this COVID-19 epidemic. So now more than ever, it's important that we are reaching out to our patients, we are providing them with our love and support, and we are helping them to navigate what can sometimes be a pretty unfriendly medical system in these challenging times. 
aside from the risks of COVID-19 itself, the current regulations around or, and guidance around social distancing and shelter in place put our patients at increased risk of drug-related morbidity and mortality. So think about somebody who's actively using opioids who gets sent to quarantine or isolation. If they're unable to access their drug of choice, they might rapidly enter withdrawal. And that might be for opioids, that might be for alcohol, that can be potentially life-threatening. And often in quarantine or isolation, they don't have access to medication addiction treatment. We are anticipating that there's an increased risk of the drug supply chain being disrupted, and therefore people may reach out and obtain drugs from something other than their usual source, which could put them at an increased risk for fentanyl contamination and overdose. Um, we know that many syringe exchange programs are having to change their models, and we worry that there's going to be a disruption in the syringe supply chain. And finally, you know, our, our harm reduction guidance for people who use drugs is always about using with somebody else. So somebody else can watch you while you use, can reverse an overdose with naloxone, can call 911. How does that play out in the setting of social distancing? What are the risks and benefits there? So I'll be talking through some of these today, um, and hopefully we can kind of address them as a community um, and, and really pay attention to these vulnerable patients. Um, I am not giving a presentation on COVID-19 itself. We have all been inundated with information about this, but I will say that a lot of the guidance around people who use drugs is about this concept of flat flattening the curve and social distancing. What we really want to do is we want to pre prevent that rapid transmission, prevent that onslaught, prevent our filling our healthcare systems. And in order to do that, we have to provide competent care for our patients who use drugs, and we have to do it as much as possible outside of the physical healthcare system. <clears throat> so in order to do social distancing and in order to pre protect our patients who may be in quarantine or isolated, one of the hallmarks of, of our care needs to be longer prescriptions than we're used to. And so right now I'll be specifically talking about buprenorphine. We'll address methadone in a little bit. Um, but in most cases for buprenorphine prescriptions in the setting of COVID-19, it makes sense to prescribe a significantly longer prescription than you're used to. I in my practice have switched to giving almost everybody a month long prescription right now. That's not specifically for people who are quarantined or isolated, that's for everybody because I want them to be able to do social distancing without having to come into the clinic, without having to come into the pharmacies. Um, in order to do this, you do have to do some patient selection. So some patients might tell you, hey, listen, I can't be, I can't be given a month long supply. I'm afraid it's gonna get stolen. I'm afraid I'm gonna lose it. I'm afraid I'm gonna take too much of it. Um, or I'm afraid I don't have a safe storage option. So using your clinical judgment, but extending the prescriptions as much as possible. I'll say because much of our audience today is I think ED based, emergency medicine based. Um, in the emergency department, normally when a patient is started on buprenorphine, they're often given <clears throat> about a seven day supply. And when they're given a seven day supply from the emergency department, they don't need to check a PDMP. Um, in California, that's called a CURES. However, if you are giving a month long supply on that initial start, please note that no matter where you're practicing, you do need to check a PDMP and you need to document that. Um, and the final thing I'll say about extending prescriptions is that for some patients, it may make sense to switch them to a longer acting medication. So some of our patients may be electing to have subcutaneous buprenorphine if they're already in clinic, because that will give them a month of, of coverage. Um, if a patient is on subcutaneous buprenorphine or is on IM naltrexone and they're due for another injection um, during a period in which they're in quarantine or they're unable to come in and see you, then potentially switching that patient to sublingual buprenorphine or to the PO naltrexone could be a good option in order to bridge them and then bring them back in, give them that, that long acting injection after they've completed uh, their quarantine period. As much as possible, it's important to do home starts in this environment. So, you know, a lot of us, I think, historically have been practicing with buprenorphine starts in the office-based environment, and that often involves a patient sitting with you in clinic for many hours at a time, uh, waiting for withdrawal symptoms or being monitored. We know that home starts are safe and effective in or out of a pandemic environment, and right now they're absolutely what we should be focusing on. Um, I'll say now briefly that as much as possible, we should all be switching our care to telephone or telehealth-based care. I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a moment, though, so I'll just leave it with that. Any appointment that you can switch to be by phone or by audiovisual should be switched. Um, many of us rely in our practices on group-based medical care. Um, 
while this is so important for many of our patients, we know that that is a high risk environment for transmission. And so we are as much as possible encouraging people to either cancel their groups or make them virtual. If it is absolutely necessary, you can do group care uh, with people more than six feet apart. But again, we really, really would advise that in most cases, we switch all of that to telehealth. And then the final tool that can be really helpful in social distancing and quarantine environments is pharmacy home deliveries. Um, so many pharmacies across the state and across the country are able to deliver medications to a patient's door, particularly if a patient is under quarantine, this is the best way for us to offer them effective care. So if you're a practitioner on the ground, I really recommend that you call around to your local pharmacies and see who right now is offering uh, deliveries you'll notice that it's a lot more than were even last week. Many pharmacies are rapidly switching to this model of care. Um, okay, I wanna take a moment to talk about telephones and telehealth, and I will say this is the area that is most rapidly changing. So keep checking back on our websites. Um, the, uh, the Ryan Height Act historically has told us that in order to provide telemedicine services with audiovisual um, treatment of a patient, you first need to have a face-to-face -face evaluation. That has been altered in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there will be um, citations at the end of my slides and also on our websites where you can look up the relevant regulations. But essentially now the face-to-face -face requirement has been removed. So if you have an audiovisual telehealth setup, and you can video conference in with a patient, you can newly initiate them on buprenorphine through that telehealth encounter without having met the patient face-to-face. -face. This is a big change um, and is really exciting for our ability to, to provide care to these vulnerable patients. Um, I'll note that there's also been a change to the HIPAA regulations. So it used to be that you had to use a um, HIPAA compliant audiovisual platform to talk to your patients um, for any reason, whether or not it was related to addiction. Now there's been guidance that has been released that HIPAA will not be enforced in the same way it has been previously. And they've explicitly given flexibility for you to use a non HIPAA compliant platform. Um, the, some platforms that they have mentioned that could be available, this is not a specific endorsement, but Zoom can be used, FaceTime can be used, Doximity has a program that can be used. They have specifically called out in those regulations who cannot be used. So please do not provide patient care over uh, uh, Facebook Live or TikTok or a platform like that. Um, but check out the regulations. You have a lot more flexibility now than you used to. Um, and then another option here is that there that you can do a new start even if the person who is seeing the patient may not have an X waiver. So this is something um, that we're working on getting additional legal clarification on, but our best understanding right now is that say your colleague is seeing a patient in an outpatient practice and your colleague does not have an X waiver. That colleague can evaluate that patient, can speak to you on the phone and you are holding the X waiver, you can call in a buprenorphine prescription to that patient after you have consulted with your colleague who is able to do a face-to-face -face consultation. So um, for ongoing care after that new start, it becomes even simpler. Um, our understanding of the regulations right now is that for ongoing care, for ongoing refills, you can provide those through either phone or through audiovisual uh, visits in the in the way you would any other form of care. So that doesn't need to be specific uh, for buprenorphine and that doesn't require a face-to-face -face encounter. Um, and I guess I'll just add, when we're switching to this telephone-based care, we're losing some things that we traditionally did, right? We're not able to do urine drug screens in the same way that we did before. We're not able to do face-to-face -face counseling in the same way that we did before. You as a clinician really do have to weigh the risks and benefits for each individual patient. But I would say that in the vast majority of cases, and this is my clinical practice, right now a urine drug screen is not as important as keeping a patient away from COVID exposure. Um, that may change on an individual patient basis, but in, in many of our practices, we are now waiving UDS requirements as long as you are not an opioid treatment program. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what those requirements might be if you are an opioid treatment program. I want to take a moment to talk about harm reduction, and this is a theme that is always near and dear to my heart, but is even more near and dear to my heart at this moment. Um, 
So we need to be working full tilt to help our patients around overdose prevention. This is whether they're already on medication for addiction treatment or whether they've been actively using opioids. The hallmarks of our normal overdose prevention are things like naloxone, things like using together with somebody else. Again, these things are changing. So please, please prescribe naloxone for all your patients and deliver it to their home if you can. Give it to them in hand if they're in, 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 um, in clinic with you. But other things need to be utilized now as well. So we're really recommending that wherever available, you get fentanyl test strips that you can deliver to your patients so they can test their drugs and know what they're using. This is particularly important if they're using alone. Um, there are options if a patient is practicing social distancing or quarantining and is continuing to use drugs um, and they're not able to use together with somebody else. Some guidance that we've gotten from our partners at the Harm Reduction Coalition include calling a friend and having them stay on the phone with you so that they can call 911 if you don't answer, um, doing a video chat with a friend in the same way. There is a website and a telephone line. It's called neveruseallone.com. Um, and this is actually a line where a, a person who is actively using drugs can call the line, provide their location, they can then use their drugs, and the folks will stay with them on the line. And if they stop responding, they will call 911 and get it sent to the patients. Um, wherever the patient has been using drugs. So these are some creative options that people are using at this moment um, to make sure that we don't see this spike in overdose mortality that we're really worried about. Um, for safe consumption supplies, for things like syringe exchanges um, and, and uh, materials like popes, pipes for smoking, um, we're working very closely with syringe exchange partners um, to make sure that these supply chains stay open, but we are worried about the potential for disruption. You know, many syringe exchanges are sort of a congregate environment where people can come and drop in and spend time. That's changing. So a lot of syringe exchanges are switching to a model where, say, a patient just comes to the door and is given a bag and then walks away, or where a model where drop-offs or deliveries are possible. Um, this is specific to California, but other states may have similar regulations. In the state of California, we are able as physicians to prescribe or dispense syringes for the prevention of the spread of infectious diseases. Check with your local regulations to see if that's possible for you. Um, in the same way we are practicing hygiene in all of our day-to-day -day lives, it is important to practice hygiene in drug use as well. So the advice that we're giving folks is, of course, to wash their hands before preparing any drugs, to clean down any surfaces. Um, if you are reusing things like pipes, um, there's really good um, guidance on the Harm Reduction Coalition website about how to sterilize those and how to clean them. Um, and, and really just working as much as possible for folks to avoid sharing any drug use supplies, particularly in this moment. And then, you know, I'm mostly talking about opioids today. Um, Four is mostly talking about opioids, but I just wanna point out that this is gonna be the case for people who use drugs across the board. So we are really worried about withdrawal from other substances. I've been hearing from some states that um, the alcohol uh, stores are closing down, the liquor stores are closing down and people might not have access to alcohol anymore. If you have somebody who is a regular heavy drinker, we have to start planning for what it's gonna be like if they can't access alcohol and they start to go into withdrawal. Um, <clears throat> some guidance around this involves potentially prescribing medications to help patients through that withdrawal. It may involve you working with the patient so that they can taper down their own use of their substances. Similarly, we're gonna have a lot of folks going into nicotine withdrawal we anticipate, so prescribing nicotine replacement therapies. Some folks may use uh, e-cigarettes instead. Some folks may um, make sure to get cigarettes delivered so that they don't go into withdrawal. We kind of need to do anything that we can in this moment to ensure that people can effectively stay in quarantine or isolation and not come back out into the community. And um, for people who use stimulants, this is of course more challenging. Um, as, as you all on this call know, we don't really have a ton of evidence-based treatments for stimulant use disorder. And um, one thing that some folks are talking about doing in the setting of this is using um, mirtazapine off-label to potentially help people with some of the dysphoria that can come with methamphetamine withdrawal. Um, but again, we'll keep sharing these resources and I think we as a community need to keep talking about best practices and how we are helping our patients reduce harm. I would highly recommend that you check out the Harm Reduction Coalition's website uh, for more information here. Okay, um, for your patients in opioid treatment programs, this is going to depend a lot on the state that you're in, so please check with your local guidance. Um, and I'll be talking mostly from the perspective of someone who does not work in an opioid treatment program, but thinking about how to work together with folks. 
So if a patient is quarantined and you know that they're an opioid treatment program, you should immediately notify that opioid treatment program so that the patient can make sure to have continuous medications. In order to just call an OTP and say, by the way, a patient has, um, has been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, you don't need uh, a 42 CFR waiver to do that if you're not a 42 CFR program yourself. Um, many opioid treatment programs are working on medication delivery, and I know here in California, the, the regulations around who can um, deliver those medications have been rapidly changing. We've got now increased flexibility to get OTP medications delivered to the door of a patient who may be in quarantine or isolation. Nationally, um, there's been guidance that has come out that has shown um, that take-homes can be approved much more across the board. So this depends on whether or not your, your um, state has declared a state of emergency, but in many cases, all stable patients can be given a 28-day take-home supply, and those patients who are deemed to be not stable can get a 14-day take-home supply. The individual opioid treatment program does, my understanding, have to apply to the state to get that blanket waiver, but once they apply for that blanket waiver, they don't need to go through patient by patient and ask for waivers. This is invaluable because if you think about it, we have so many patients who go to our opioid treatment programs every morning and stand in line or sit in a crowded waiting room. We want to get them out of that unsafe environment and we need to provide them with extra medications. Again, weigh the risks and benefits for the individual patient in front of you, um, but in many cases, these longer take-home supplies could be life-saving. <clears throat> Different states have different regulations right now about counseling and urine toxicology. So I would refer you to your um, local Department of Healthcare Service and your um, local OTP governing bodies. Um, but we are seeing that many states are decreasing the counseling regulations, allowing counseling to occur by telephone, um, and many states are um, decreasing uh, the requirements for urine toxicology. I'll say here as well that um, uh, just this morning, additional guidance came out around 42 CFR, part two. Um, so check out that link at the end of our presentation and check it out on our website. But what we're seeing is that they appear to be granting increased flexibility for you as a medical provider to determine whether or not a medical emergency is occurring um, and giving you some increased flexibility around 42 CFR. It seems like a lot of that will look like potentially giving consent for release of information over the phone or determining that if a patient is in an acutely unstable or acutely emergent medical situation that 42 CFR's regulations may be waived in that case. Um, but again, check with your, your local regulations on that fact. Um, okay, that's most of the heavy clinical content here, but I do wanna take a moment to talk about a couple other key points. Um, when we talk about people who use drugs or people who are on medication for addiction treatment, <coughs> it's a population with a high level of trauma at baseline. This is a patient population who sometimes is really reliant on counseling and on groups like 12-step programs or smart recovery or groups at their local OTP to provide them with support. Um, and, you know, we're all being traumatized by this time right now um, by the social isolation of this epidemic. But that's next level, I think, an issue for many of our patients who use drugs. And so I want to emphasize that while the in-person conversations may not be happening, it's so vital that we continue to provide telephone-based support or telemedicine-based support so that our patients can still get the counseling that they need, can access the group visits that they need. Um, and many, many programs across the state have really rapidly ramped up their access to telephone-based counseling services. Um, many of our programs that we've been working with are actually just calling patients to check in to see how they're doing, um, texting patients to check in and see how they're doing. Um, we know that people who use drugs always face a lot of stigma in the community, and we, we know that um, contracting COVID can give somebody a lot of stigma in the community. And so it's so important that we provide love and support for our patients and that we work with our local health systems to make sure that people who use drugs aren't being stigmatized and that they're getting the evidence-based treatment, uh, including harm reduction, that they need. Many of our patients will be facing real financial struggles in the upcoming days, weeks, months. Um, and so we're also trying to be exceedingly mindful about making sure that co-pays are really reduced as much as possible for our patients um, and that we're there for them uh, through the trauma of potentially losing a job um, and that we help support them kind of in continuing their recovery despite that. 
And then I'll say, you know, I've mostly been talking about patients here, but but the healthcare providers on the front lines of this epidemic, including the healthcare providers who are working in our OTPs and in our outpatient programs and in our residential programs, may also themselves be facing a lot of trauma and facing a lot of social isolation. So this is a moment where we as a community can really step up and support each other um, through this challenging time. Um, I do wanna specifically note that there are um, uh, many communities, including ours in California and our California Bridge program that are really where our addiction program is really run by our navigators and our peer supports. And they're really the heart and soul of our addiction treatment system. Um, in most cases, the right thing to do here is to have our navigators and peers work remotely and kind of keep them out of the healthcare system. So for example, in many emergency departments where we usually have navigators stationed in those EDs, because they are high risk for the transmission of COVID, we've pulled our navigators out of those EDs um, and the navigators are providing all of their services by phone. Now that might not work in every community, that might not work in every hospital, but wherever possible to have people not be co-located with acute medical care is going to be a good idea right now. Um, particularly that's the case for any uh, medical workers, including peers and navigators who might have medical comorbidities or who might be vulnerable for other reasons. Um, so work with your navigators and your peers in your community to do um, remote access to the EHR, to provide phone consultations, and then just to make sure that if those navigators usually were providing patients um, materials such as handouts, uh, directions, things like that, make sure that all of that stuff is printed out and available for any patients who may be physically in person who can't meet with a navigator. Um, navigators and peers um, who are working on site really do need training on the use of PPE, of proper donning and doffing, and on the local COVID policy trainings. Um, we wanna make sure that in addition to the frontline doctors and nurses getting trained, anyone who is in the healthcare system physically needs to receive trainings on this so that we can keep all of our healthcare workers safe. Okay, so I'm about to wrap up, but I think big picture, the take home points here are, as this environment is rapidly changing, what we need to do is both increase support for our patients and do that as much as possible by phone, by telehealth, by you name it, any way we can support them. But at the same time, decrease in-person contact, decrease in-person visits, decrease frequent refills, um, decrease unnecessary in-person urine drug screens and things along those lines. We need to continue our focus, not just on evidence-based medication for opioid use disorder, but also on harm reduction and really make sure that our patients are able uh, to be as safe as possible, um, both from COVID and from sequelae of substance use disorders. And then we as caregivers need to really protect ourselves, um, work together as a community, support each other um, in this really challenging time. Um, so there's a list of resources here. We'll be sharing these after the fact. Um, but you can go through and kind of click through and see the different regulatory changes that I've discussed today. Um, and I think on that note, we will be opening things up for questions. Um, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Great, thanks, thanks, Anna. If you can uh, actually just advance the slide, one more slide. Great. Um, so with that, um, you know, I, I apologize uh, at the beginning. I, I see that some people were having issues uh, hearing me with my microphone. Um, hopefully that's been taken care of now, but I just will repeat a couple things because uh, I saw some of the questions quickly. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, uh, is being recorded and will be posted on our website uh, as well as the slides after uh, the webinar is complete. So if you didn't catch anything, it'll all be up there. Um, for the, and, and our resources page is gonna have a lot of the uh, resources that uh, Hannah mentioned, as well as a few other uh, guidances from federal agencies. Um, is, so for the Q&A session, I see that some of you are using it now. Um, uh, at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen, there's a, a Q&A button uh, that opens up a box. Uh, we encourage, you can ask a question there, but we encourage you to look at the questions that are already asked there uh, and upload with the little thumbs up button there, the question that you may be interested in so we can get to the ones that are the most pressing. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to open up the, the questions to Hannah, Jody, uh, and Danny. Um, so the first question that we have uh, that seems to be the most upvoted is, uh, what are the drug testing requirements or recommendations for prescribing uh, buprenorphine remotely? Uh, so I will uh, toss it up to the panel. 
Um, so this is this is Jody. I think Hannah addressed this uh, mm -hmm. a little bit in her presentation. And um, first, of course, thank you to Dr. Snyder for for all of that mm -hmm. fantastic information and to the four team for putting this together. Um, but there is no official guidance within the federal guidance addressing um, opening up telehealth for induction. But what a lot of states are doing are simply waiving the requirement for UDS upon initiation. Um, and it does seem that that's what Dr. Heider's, I'm sorry, Dr. Snyder suggested. Great. Anything to anybody yeah, have? I, I'll just second that and say that um, it's going to depend on your local regulations. But in most cases, for example, for a patient who's been stable in treatment, who you might be infrequently doing UDSs on, that's not a patient where most of the time it would make sense to bring them in specifically to do the UDS because doing so might put them at increased risk. Um, but use your clinical judgment there. Great. Great, so we can uh, move on to the, the second question. Uh, can buprenorphine and stimulants that are scheduled to uh, be mailed to people's homes from pharmacies? Does the recent Ryan Height Act waiver allow phone call without video to be the initial patient contact uh, or video only? So I'll address the the Ryan. Hey, this is Danny. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. And I, I just kind of wanted to step back to, I know on slide 15, um, you know, Dr. Snyder, I, I wanted to make sure we're, we're being precise. So um, I'll kind of just start over on that slide, but basically with Ryan Hayes, so if, if you're, you know, prescribing or dispensing a controlled medication via the internet, and right, the internet is a very broad term, you first need an in-person exam, at least one in-person exam before the uh, controlled medication can be dispensed. Um, however, there are exceptions um, to the in-person exam requirement, you know, including the telemedicine exception, and there are very specific, distinct scenarios that must be met um, in order to, to qualify for that exception. Um, and I think what we were getting at is, you know, before this public health emergency, kind of the main ways you could use telemedicine were, you know, you could have this remote um, x wavered uh, prescriber, um, but problematically the patient would have to be physically located in a DEA registered hospital, or they need to be sitting next to, you know, a DEA registered uh, practitioner, whether that be, you know, another physician or, or a PA or, or whatnot. But um, that is kind of how we've been operating. But what's unique uh, and kind of unprecedented right now is there's another public health emergency exception and it's much more forgiving, right? So now you can, you can um, prescribe without uh, doing an in-person exam uh, if telemedicine is being conducted, you know, during this public health emergency, um, it involves uh, patients located in such areas and such controlled substances as the secretary uh, with the concurrence of the attorney general designates, but you know, you, you, in order to do that, really all you have to do is do what you have to do all the time is, you know, make sure you're prescribing uh, uh, for a legitimate medical purpose and acting in the usual course of professional practice. You got to do that anyway, um, but you do have to still use um, an audio visual real time two way interactive communication system. And then on top of that, uh, you need to make sure you're uh, complying with all other uh, applicable uh, federal and state laws as you would, you know, you know in an in-person uh, encounter. And you know, there might be some uh, unique situations in your state that you might have unique laws in your state related to telemedicine as well. So um, I just did want to clear that up uh, a little bit. Thank you. Great, and of course, all these questions, um, you know, we will be building an FAQ out. So if uh, uh, if you didn't catch some of that, um, you know, this will all be written out for everybody to on our website, uh, so you can get your answers. And can, and what was the question related to the stimulants and the what the, the? So this was this was you know buprenorphine. So can buprenorphine and stimulants, uh, Schedule Two stimulants, uh, be mailed to people's homes from pharmacies? Uh, does the recent Ryan Height Act waiver? Uh, allow phone call without video to be the initial patient contact or video only? 
No, you still need the initial, the initial still has to be, you know, in lieu of this in-person exam, you do need it to be real time, you know, two way interactive audio visual. Uh, in terms of mailing a schedule two to someone's home, I, I don't believe so. Um, I would have to double check on that. I don't know if there have been any specific carve outs uh, for that uh, in, in this situation, but I would have to, to do a double check on that. Okay, so we can get um, everybody that answer um, yeah. in a day or two. Great. Um, so the next question um, is a, a few that are being pushed up right now. Um, so considering the push to release people from jails and prisons, uh, what recommendations do you have for facilities to ensure continuity of care for uh, MOUD treatment upon release? I guess it's more of a potentially clinical question. Um, I can take a stab at that, although I would say that I, I don't work in a jail or prison system. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um, there is a big push to release people from jails and prisons um, uh, to decrease the risk of transmission. Um, if people are being released from jails and prisons and are currently on medications for opioid use disorder, um, then we would, of course, recommend that the medical staff of that jail or prison reaches out to a community provider to make sure that the patient has continuity of care. Um, if the patient has not already been started on those medications, although I would, of course, advocate that they are started on, on those medications before release, it's, it's just vital that the patient is given um, potentially an appointment, a phone number, a place that they can drop in, a place that they can really rapidly access that care. Because we know that when patients are released from jails or prisons, um, often they have decreased opioid tolerance and they're at increased risk of overdose. And that's really gonna be compounded in this moment right now. Um, so anything that folks can do to have a close partnership with a community treatment provider who can reach out to that patient immediately upon their release and make sure that they have continuity of medications is going to be vital. And then anything that um, the on, on site provider can do to make sure that the patient leaves with a, a decent size um, and that deferred to clinical judgment, um, a decent sized prescription for buprenorphine. So not walking out the door with uh, one day's worth, but trying to extend that prescription um, so that the patient has time to transition care and doesn't fall out of treatment in that transition. Mm -hmm. But these are, uh, these are unprecedented times and these are unprecedented issues. And I think we'll all be working together to find the best practices there. Great. And, and we can also reach out to our network as well um, that have a, you know, a lot of experience in delivering MAT programs in, in prisons as well and get some answers about that. Um, so the next question has been asked in, in, in a variety of different ways. Um, but, you know, how do you start, um, you know, let's say a patient experiencing homelessness or, or someone who doesn't have a, a phone or a smartphone and can't be seen? Um, you know, how do you start that patient then in an MAT program um, if, if most of this population doesn't have a phone either call up or have an initial intake or audio visual services. Most of the time they're going to walk in and request those services. Um, so, so how would you go about doing that? I'll take this one um, and folks can correct me if they have other thoughts, but um, our practice right now is to still offer those walk, it, walk up drop in services. So I don't think we'll ever be able to switch all of our services to, to phone because you're right, many of our patients don't have phones. And certainly many of our patients don't have phones with um, audiovisual telehealth access. Um, so I think it is still important for us to be able to offer uh, intakes, offer rapid access, same day new starts for all of our patients in person. We just wanna minimize this as much as possible. So if we can switch some patients to telehealth, that decreases the number of patients in our programs. Um, if we can have patients come back much less for follow-up visits and switch the follow-up visits to be by phone, then that's a really great thing that we can do as well. But there will always be some patients who need to be seen in person just because they don't have access to other mechanisms. Um, for their follow-up, you may consider writing longer prescriptions than you usually would so that they don't have to come in too often just so they don't get that additional exposure. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I guess extending that question on uh, you know, patients experiencing homelessness, uh, how should we approach homeless patients with, uh, you know, with interrupted drug supply that may be subjected to a quarantine and therefore maybe have to experience withdrawal? Uh, 
Um, I'm taking it that this is for patients who are not already initiated on medications. Um, uh, not clarified, but uh, yeah, I think that's the, an assumption. Okay. So um, our philosophy and our approach is whenever we're talking to a person who actively uses opioids, uh, whether, you know, no matter what they're coming in for, we are always offering them ac access to medications for opioid use disorder. If you're walking in the emergency department for a cellulitis, we're offering you medications for opioid use disorder. If you're walking in primary care, we're offering those to you as well. And I don't think that changes in this scenario. I think that um, because patients are worried about interruptions in drug supply, because patients are worried about the risk of withdrawal, um, because patients are just worried about their health in general in this moment, this may be a time where we see increasing numbers of patients presenting to access medications for opioid use disorder, including buprenorphine and methadone. Um, so we should be offering it to them. Um, and we should be having conversations with patients who we know to be actively using drugs about what would they do if they were placed in a quarantine or isolation situation, about harm reduction measures that they could take, um, and to see whether or not they are interested in starting on buprenorphine, in which case perhaps they could be prescribed medications and could do um, a home start. Um, so those are a couple different options. I, I think that um, the same principles of evidence-based medications and harm reduction apply here that they did, you know, two months ago. Um, and we just want to make sure we're offering resources to all of our patients. And this is, this is Jody. Um, I appreciate that response, Dr. Schneider. And I am not a clinician. I'm a pretty pure policy person. But um, there is some helpful guidance um, that the state of Connecticut has put out, as well as um, the guidance that Dr. Schneider referenced previously from the Harm Reduction Coalition uh, for people who are actively using drugs. Um, and one of those recommendations is to have things like antidiarrheals and NSAIDs uh, available um, in the event that withdrawal becomes inevitable. Um, and I, I know that that can be an uncomfortable thing to think about and an uncomfortable conversation to have with patients. Um, but I think that goes back to those same harm reduction principles um, that, that existed to, to Dr. Snyder's point two months ago. Um, those are, are good things for people who use drugs to have around anyway. So it might be a conversation worth having with those patients. Great. Great, so um, I'm just gonna move down the, the list of questions here. Um, again, you know, if we don't get to your question, we will be uh, answering these in an FAQ as well. So stay tuned. Um, so we have one question uh, regarding the peer recovery specialist. So, uh, uh, Dr. Snyder, you, you briefly uh, referred to education about COVID-19 for peer recovery specialists co-located with medical services. Uh, are there other resources you are aware of to provide education and guidance for peer recovery specialists who are working in a community or local health department setting? A great question. I am not aware off the top of my head of resources, but we can look for those. I know that Yale put out some best practices for um, providers in addiction, set, in addiction treatment settings, but I don't know that those specifically um, addressed peers. Mm -hmm. so we can look for that. Okay, so we can, um, we can come back to that one. So um, we may have time for one or two more questions. So we do have some questions around um, you know, where people can find best practices for uh, telehealth for OTPs. Mm. Um, so this is Jody. There are um, several, obviously, of the, the guidelines that have come out of SAMHSA, though those do tend to be relatively broad. I would encourage folks to look on their state behavioral health websites or state health department um, perhaps even your state licensing board. A lot of state websites right now are actively, literally in this moment, putting out guidance um, that, will, that will help you understand exactly what the steps are that you need to take as an OTP in your state. Um, also always, if, especially if you're running an OTP as opposed to um, a primary care clinic that's providing buprenorphine, you do have a state SOTA who can help you navigate those things. Um, but, I, I would start with your state websites. Great, and I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, so uh, Dr. Snyder, you mentioned, um, you know, that uh, you know, this pa uh, the patient population may have uh, trouble finance, uh, financing their treatment um, during this time period. Uh, so you mentioned reducing, uh, potentially reducing co-pays. 
Uh, curi- uh, one person is curious to hear your thoughts on the role that payers uh, and other places could, uh, could provide in, in, in being able to accomplish that. I think it's a great question. I think um, we'll be seeing over the coming weeks how payers are responding to this. Um, uh, I haven't seen a lot of a new guidance come out for um, payers over the last few days. I will say though that um, there have been some changes in terms of payment for telehealth services. So that's been a question that I think a lot of patients have been asking is if I switch to doing a phone visit, am I gonna get a bill for that? Is that gonna be covered? Um, that's gonna depend on the, the on the ground or who the payer is, um, what state you're in, but more and more we're seeing that folks are offering to pay and to reimburse for these telehealth services. So that can be a good option for our patients. Um, and then I'll say that as the provider, uh, it behooves us to kind of pause and think about, does this patient need a brand name medication? Could this patient benefit from a generic medication or another medication that might be cheaper if they're paying out of pocket, um, particularly in this time of financial strain? Great. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the Q&A session. Um, again, you know, this webinar is, is recorded and um, an FAQ will be made uh, available on our website. Um, like we said before, I don't know if people caught it, but um, you know, we're going to try to make this a weekly webinar, you know, uh, Thursday, 3 p.m. Uh, we're going to try to hold down that time. Uh, so next week, we're thinking about uh, potentially having one on, on state policies uh, specific to the, the crisis here. Um, and uh, of course, again, when, they, when this webinar ends, you'll be directed to a survey, a poll. Uh, and please fill that out so you can let us know, you know, what are the concerns that you see on the ground? Uh, what are the issues that you're facing? You know, what would be a great topic? Uh, for webinars and for other resources that we'll develop that will help the community. Um, please again check out our, our resources page uh, that's going to be updated daily with new information and guidance. Um, and uh, please continue to, to, to follow uh, the foundation uh, for the latest updates uh, and uh, we hope that, that we thank again the panel, uh, Dr. Snyder, Jody, Manz, and uh, Daniel McLugan for for their help here, you know? So please reach out to us anytime. Um, if you can just um, move the slide one over, Hannah, um, you can find our uh, email address here. Uh, for any general inquiries, you can email us at info at 4FDN.org. And again, our website is www.4FDN.org. Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, we hope that this has been helpful. Thank you.